26, 26. Ruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for uh, attending. Again, welcome to our home. The, um, the lecture on my thoughts today, I think, will be on a uh, very important subject that we are all invested today. Again, the lecture today is on burial versus cremation. Um, with the pandemic still relevant in all of our lives, I would think that all of us, at one time or another, uh, during the last two years, have thought about death and our mortality. That thought, of course, begets another thought, at least to some people, that of burial or cremation. An important decision. A decision that, once done, cannot be corrected. Before I began my investigation about cremation, I was under the false impression that cremation was better for the environment in many ways. <laughs> what I found was just the opposite. Cremation releases mercury and other toxins into the air and also uses an enormous amount of fossil fuels. Environmentalists worldwide choose green burial with no embalming or metal caskets. Now, how many of us really know what cremation is and what it does to the body of our loved ones? Uh, it seems quick, just push a button and it's all over. <laughs> Wrong. Wrong. A body burns in the oven for approximately two hours. Body fluids bubble, muscles expand and contract, and the brain sizzles. What remains afterwards is not ashes, but burnt and dehydrated bones. The bones are removed by a simple crematory worker, and then they are ground up and pulverized into dust, ash, in a machine. This is done so that the remains will fit neatly into an urn. You know, an interesting factoid, burial uses up very little land, and there is an amazing amount of land available for cemeteries. They state that if all Americans choose to be buried, it would take 10,000 years to use up just 1% of the land available. Most of this land that is available is within one to two hours from urban areas. It is an undisputed fact that burial is much more common in monotheistic societies while cremation rates are higher in pagan, polytheistic, and post-Christian communities, such as Japan, Nepal, Thailand, where the rate of cremation is over 95%. Burial is a statement that one believes in God. Think of it. When you find something detestable, what you do is you want to destroy it completely, so you burn it. We see this scenario played out in Jewish history. After all, both temples were burned to the ground by their conquerors. Ironically, not long ago, cremation and the scattering of ashes of the deceased were done as a punishment to the worst of criminals. This was done as a sign that their memory and impact was gone forever. From Abraham, our father, to the Holocaust, our enemies have tried to make us disappear, to wipe out any remnant of our existence by a consuming fire, you know, there's a saying that goes, all that goes around comes around. I find it interesting that in Germany before the Second World War, the preferred method of burial for Jews was cremation. Well, Hitler agreed. Why? Because it was his desire to wipe out not just the Jews, but any memory of their existence at all. Think of it. When a little child loses a pet, they many times want to bury their pet in their backyard. They don't burn them. We bury the things that we love, and again, we don't burn them. We read in the Torah, in the story of creation, that man was created, but Salam Elohim, in the image of God. We make it a point to bury worn Torah scrolls and other holy objects. There is nothing, nothing holier in creation than that which God made in his own image, mankind. Cremation is a loud, disgusting, and a violent procedure performed on the bodies of our loved ones. More often than not, a family will opt for creation for financial reasons, since cre cremation is usually cheaper. In addition, the process is quicker, and there are those who just want to get it over with. You know, the FDA, the National Funeral Directors Association, states that more than one half of the funerals that are performed in the United States today are cremations. They predict that in 20 years, that number will climb to approximately 
The driving force hmm, is money. Death brings with it a sense of grief. Decisions have to be made, and many of them are made in haste. After all is said and done many times, there are regrets. Decisions that cannot be undone. Burial leaves no such regrets. The family says their goodbyes, and then they escort their loved one to their final resting place. Not only the deceased, but also the mourners attain a, a certain sense of inner peace. Now, burial respects the cycle of life. We return our bodies back from where it came, back to the bosom of Mother Earth. Burial is peaceful, natural, and respectful. With burial, the family has provided a solemn and meaningful memorial for the eternal soul of their loved one. By burying a loved one who has passed on, we show our love and respect for not only their bodies, but also a testimony to the lives that they led. You know, we use the term RAP, which stands for rest in peace, to indicate that we believe that the time will come when all souls who are only resting in their graves will arise and live eternally. What we refer to as Chiat HaMesim, the revival of the dead. A time that will be ushered in with the coming of the Messiah may come quickly and in our time. We have a belief that just as Adam, first man, was created from the dust of the earth, so too the bodies of those that will be resurrected at the end of time will be reformed from the earth that surrounded them as they rested in their graves. Now visiting a cemetery can be a form of therapy, a comfort to family and friends. Our rabbis tell us that a person is having difficulty dealing with challenges of life, such as addictions or desires, well, let them go to a cemetery. Thinking about your mortality can many times help place your problems and desires in a healthier and more sobering light. We also go to cemeteries to visit the dead as the connection, again, to the world above and to have them be advocates for us, as we do to many righteous people. But all family members have that power. When the Roman historian Tacitus described the Jewish nation, he noted that the Jews bury rather than burn their dead. We read many times in the Torah that death and burial, um, the first mention of death and burial in the Torah is with Abram Avinu, Abraham our father, who buried his beloved wife Sarah. Sarah. He buried her in the cave, the Machpelah, that he had purchased from Ephron Achiti. He too was buried in the same cave by his two sons, Yitzchak and Ishmael. Then after his passing, Yitzchak, our father, was buried by his two sons, Esau and Yaakov, in the same cave together with his father, Avram. Then we see just how important burial was to our forefathers. We read in the beginning of the last portion of the book of Genesis that Yaakov, our father, before his death, asked his favorite son, Yosef, to take an oath concerning his burial. Yaakov wanted an assurance from Yosef that he would bury him with his father and grandfather in the cave of the Machpelah in the land of Israel. You know, when the Jewish nation left Egypt, it was Moshe himself, the greatest man of the generation, who took the coffin of Yosef with them. In return for the, that kindness that he extended to Yosef, he was rewarded that it was God Almighty himself who attended to Moshe's burial. There's no mention anywhere in the Torah about cremation. Burial is a positive commandment in the Torah, while cremation huh, is a severe transgression against God's will. It doesn't matter whether you are religious or not. Choosing burial is a statement that declares, I was born a Jew and I will die a Jew. In the book of Genesis, God says to, to Adam, the first man created, Earth you are and to earth you will return. In Ecclesiastes and in, in Kohelis, King Shomadel, King Solomon writes in connection with death and burial, the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to God who gave it. We have to understand what the relationship is between the body and the soul in this world. Well, think of a person who flies into a city for business. At the airport, they, they rent a car. While they are in the city, they use the car to attend to their business. They assume all responsibility for the maintenance and care of that vehicle while the car is in their possession. When they have finished their business in the city, well, they return the car back to the car rental. If they have damaged the vehicle in any way, 
They are held responsible for all damages. They must pay. All of this <clears throat> is an analogy to our lives in this world. Our soul, so to speak, flies into this world and then rents a body. While it resides on earth, it uses the body to fulfill its mission. When the soul has concluded its business in this world, it returns home, back to heaven, and the body returns back to where it originated from, Mother Earth. Burial is an act of gratitude to the body, thanking it for its assistance while the soul resided on this earth. In reality, we don't own our bodies any more than we own the car that we rent at the airport. Based on that fact, we do not have the permission to donate organs after we die. The body that we have occupied while on earth was not ours to give away once the soul leaves this world. However, while the person is alive, they are permitted to donate any organ, such as a kidney, to save another person's life. Kavit Hames, showing honor to a dead body, takes precedence over many commandments in the Torah. Even a Kohen Gadol, the high priest, the holiest man in the world, Though the Torah does not permit him to defile himself to any dead body, even that of his own parents, if he happens to be out in the field and he comes upon a dead body, if there is no one else available, he would be required to bury that dead body even though it would place him in a state of defilement. This concept of showing honor to the dead is also why we as Jews do not view the remains of the body of our deceased relative. Before a body is buried, it receives a ritual cleansing, what we call, refer to as a tahara. The body is cleaned and groomed, and then water is ritually poured over it. Water is the sperm of all creation. Mayim, water, is also connected to ritual purity in Torah. This connects with the concept of a mikvah, a pool of rainwater that we use as a form of ritual purification for our bodies on special occasions, such as for a woman who purify themselves every month after their menstrual cycle. Her period is viewed <clears throat> as a loss of an opportunity for life, a form of death, which creates a necessity for spiritual purification. Now, after the body is purified, <clears throat> excuse me, it is dressed in special white clothing, which we call tachrichen, shrouds. The white clothing adds a sense of purity and holiness to the body of the deceased. It is a positive commandment in the Torah to bury the deceased as soon as possible. There are those who do so even on the same day. This is considered a kindness to both the body and to the soul. This is what we refer to as an in-between state before the burial because it puts the soul in limbo. It is as the Yiddish saying goes, Nishahir and Nishahin, neither here nor there. The deceased has no body with which to relate to this world nor is it totally free of its connection to this world, so as to be able to relate to things on a purely spiritual level. With burial, both the body and the soul can return to their proper place in peace. At a funeral home, it's customary to say a eulogy, comforting words about the life of the deceased. Now, we read in the Torah in the book of Genesis, in the beginning of the portion of Chayasara, that Avram Avinu came, lispot l'sorba l'vkosa, he came to eulogize Sarah and to cry for her. Giving a eulogy is one of the most difficult responsibilities that one can assume. We are told by our sages that the prosecuting angel listens carefully to the eulogy. If he can detect any statement that is untrue or an embellishment of the truth, he uses those exact words to accuse the deceased of not living up to the praises that were offered on their behalf. So, why give a eulogy at all? Based on what I've said, there are those who do not eulogize the dead. In addition, we read in Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers, Hakol B'Sefer Nechtavim, everything is written in a book, which tells us that the heavenly court already knows everything about the person in their life. So what benefit can there be for the deceased to be eulogized? It would seem that they can only be hurt by the words of the eulogy. So the Zohar tells us that when someone is being eulogized, God sends down the angels to listen to the eulogy. But why? If everything is written in a book, what purpose does it serve to have the angels listen to the eulogy? 
So the Zohar explains that if the eulogy can demonstrate that the life that the deceased lived was instrumental in some way with helping others on their journey in life, well, then that merit can outweigh many of the commandments that the deceased may have transgressed in their lifetime. After the service, the body of the deceased is escorted by the assembled guest to a waiting hearst. Even if one cannot attend the service at the cemetery, well, they should at least walk behind the hearse for a short distance. By doing so, one fulfills the important mitzvah of Alvoyas Hamet, of escorting the deceased. Those men who have been given the honor of carrying the coffin, the pallbearers, take it to the waiting car. When the hearse reaches the cemetery, they then remove the casket and place it at the graveside. By doing so, they have fulfilled a very special mitzvah. Any kindness done for the deceased is referred to as chesed shalemus, the kindness of all truths. All the acts that one performs for the benefit of the deceased are termed as the truest of kindness, since they can, there can be no ulterior motive. The deceased can never pay you back for your care and concern, a true act of altruism. Jewish law requires that the entire body be returned to the earth. No parts of the body may be left out. Based on this commandment, autopsies are not permitted by Jewish law since they violate the body's integrity and almost always result in parts of the body not receiving a proper burial. In the case of an amputation, that limb that was removed must be buried. You place the body in a simple wooden casket, and some even place holes in the bottom of the casket. This is done so as to accelerate the decomposition of the body. Yet we have a belief that the soul does not rest in peace until the body is totally decomposed in the grave. We cover the casket with earth, but we do so begrudgingly. We are not in a hurry to say goodbye to our loved one. So the custom is that as we place our first shovel of dirt into the grave, we hold the shovel back side up. In addition, when we have finished shoveling, we do not pass the shovel by hand from one mourner to another. We put the shovel back in the pile of soil that we will be placed in the grave and the next person takes it from there. The assembled guests wait until the grave is completely covered and then the mourners recite a special Kaddish, prayer for the dead. Before we leave the cemetery, those in attendance form two lines to which the mourners will pass. As they depart the graveside, we say the words of comfort to them. We say the Hebrew words, May the Almighty comfort you together with all of those who mourn for Zion and Jerusalem. This prayer uses the Hebrew word, Eschem, the plural term for the word you, because the loss of one Jewish soul is a loss to all of us since we, are, we as Jews are all one body. This then would formally end the burial service. When one leaves the cemetery, it is accustomed to uproot some blades of grass. One reason for this custom is just like the grass withers at night and is rejuvenated during the day, so too we look forward to the day of the revival of the dead, when we will once again be united with our loved one. Another custom that people observe at the cemetery is to place a stone on the headstone as a sign that someone visited the grave. It is customary to place a stone with one's left hand. The Torah commands us to mourn for our closest relatives. We mourn for the loss of our parents, siblings, spouses, and God forbid our children. We are obligated to tear a part of our clothing that covers our heart. This ritual is referred to as the kriya, the tearing. It is seen as an expression of our deep pain and sorrow at the loss of our loved one. I should, a Jew should only be buried in a Jewish cemetery amongst other Jews. It is a Jewish tradition that the body of the deceased should be handled only by fellow Jews. This tradition includes carrying the casket, placing the casket in the grave, and filling the grave with earth. Also, while one is in the cemetery, those attending the funeral should not have their tzitzit, their fringes, visible. If, they, if the tzitzit can be viewed, it's seen as a mocking of the dead, since those who are interred in the cemetery can no longer perform any mitzvot. 
There's also a Jewish tradition of placing a headstone on a grave as a marker that a person is buried there. There's a saying that by placing a headstone at the grave, you, so to speak, leave all the heavy memories at the graveside. And all those light memories, well, we take them with us. In addition, there is a Kabbalistic belief that there are five parts to the soul of man. The headstone serves as a perch for one part of the soul that stays with the body until it will be resurrected with the coming of Mashiach. The headstones many times tell us things about the deceits that we may not have known, such as whether they were a Kohen or a Levite, and other facts. So, one should really ask themselves, does it make any sense to cremate, even if someone doesn't believe and has not lived a religious lifestyle? Still, on the maybe, that there is a heaven and a hereafter, <laughs> why not at least allow for the possibility that all bodies will be reincarnated with the coming of the Messiah? You know, we all buy lottery tickets, <clears throat> even though the odds are astronomical. Yet somehow we believe that we will win. Why not look at burial and the revival of the dead in the same way? Bet on the long shot. Choose burial. Who knows? You might just get lucky and win a ticket to eternity. And with that, let us look forward to ushering in the coming of Mashiach Sukkano quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending and listening. Uh, if you know someone who is thinking about cremation, please send this lecture on to them, have them listen to it. It's very, very important. If you can stop someone from cremating a loved one, it would be a great benefit to the family and a great benefit to the person. Again, have a be healthy, be happy, be safe, and God should bless you with revealed good. Again, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for listening.